Sheridan, and I'm the Acting Associate Director of the Health Law Institute, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to our Health Law and Policy Seminar Series. This is our last seminar of the academic year, and so let me take this opportunity to thank you for being such an engaged audience uh, throughout our series. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, coming and contributing uh, to each and every one of our speakers' presentations. And it's really been quite a wonderful year of conversation and engagement, so thank you. Um, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Oscar Cabrera to uh, present for our final seminar. Uh, beyond being a long time, we feel old now when we're able to say we've been friends for so long in the field, but we have been friends for a very long time. Um, Oscar is the executive director of the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law at Georgetown uh, University uh, Law Center. Um, and so this institute is a pretty remarkable institute. It's a globally recognized leader uh, in the field, but it also occupies a very particular niche, and this is what I wanted to speak to. It has a particular strategic advantage, and this is that it's focused on the way in which, and to try and understand law, um, as a fundamental tool for addressing critical health issues in our communities. And I say this because the center really focuses on law as a positive tool rather than focusing only on the limitations of law or how law contributes to poor health. And I think this is quite a different orientation uh, for lawyers in global health. Um, and Oscar and his team have very much put this idea into play very creative in their use of law and its constructive capacities, and you can see this in the number of areas in which they work. So I'd invite you to jump onto the website of the Institute, but I see Oscar's also brought a number of brochures about the Institute here, so if you're interested in it, you can see they're engaged in food and drug law, global health governance, health and human rights, with a particular uh, focus on reproductive health, trade investment in health, and infectious and non-communicable diseases. Um, and so today, Oscar will present, you can see in the slide, um, on international and comparative law perspectives on tobacco and alcohol marketing regulations. So Oscar will present for about 40 minutes, um, and then we will open the floor for questions and conversation. So welcome, Oscar. Well, thank you very much, John, and thank you uh, for the invitation to be here. Um, I was looking at the previous slide, this is the Health Law Seminar 2015-16 and connecting with what Joanna was just saying, uh, the last time I was in Dalhousie was actually 2006 for the Health Law, National Health Law Conference and that was, I was a student back then uh, doing my LM at the University of Toronto. So it's been 10 years. I think we can say we know each other for, for a long time. 10 years seems like a... Yeah. Um, so today what I want to talk about, really I want to leave a lot of time for questions, I try to I always say this, I'll try to make it short and then of course I end up talking for the, the whole time they gave me, but I'll try. I'll make uh, an effort to make, uh, to make it very short and concise. Um, I'll be talking about non-communicable diseases, risk factors for non-communicable diseases and how do we see law and human rights law in particular relate to uh, risk factors for non-communicable diseases and then I really want to focus on one of the key interventions that we have been seen that is successful in tobacco, that we're now thinking and applying to alcohol, food, unhealthy foods, which is restriction of marketing. So that's a space in which we're going to spend more time talking about marketing restrictions uh, from a legal policy perspective and make some reference to a couple of the uh, most important cases that we have seen in the context of tobacco and marketing. Um, so this is the structure of my presentation, just very three uh, uh, big areas, human rights and NCDs, why human rights and NCDs, then a little bit on freedom of expression in the context of marketing, and then try to really navigate whether there's actually a conflict or not. Uh, we like to think there's not a conflict between human rights and marketing restrictions, and uh, we'll talk about that when we get to that. Joanna already was very kind uh, to uh, introduce uh, the work we do at the Institute. I have a couple of slides here. And I always include this um, because it's a, it's, a, it's a different model. We are, if I want to kind of summarize it in, in, in a sentence, we are operate almost like a thin tank within the law school, a research institute, but also is very engaged on the applied side of the work. Uh, and I think that's a space in which health law tends to live. It's not just theory, it's not just, it's very important theory and we really do uh, uh, pay a lot of attention to scholarship and supporting the, the uh, knowledge generation, but a lot of our work is how do we translate that into practice? How do we work with the key actors, governments at the 
specific national level, international organizations, civil service organizations. So we work in that uh, in between uh, uh, space. Uh, Joanna mentioned these are our seven thematic areas. Um, we're very ambitious, so we try to cover everything under health law. Uh, and as Joanna said, we don't have a thematic area on reproductive rights, but we fold that into health and human rights, which is uh, how our approach has been to reproductive rights. Uh, the institute is, is small for what we're trying to do. We're 20 people full-time working at the institute. We have um, lawyers, associates, fellows. We have the directors who are either recognized in their field and then we bring them to the institute so they can build specific uh, uh, programs in specific areas. In addition to that, we have faculty members that are engaged with the work of the institute, but they're not count on, on the, on the when, when I say that we have 20 people at the institute. Uh, so these are the basic three lines of work, scholarship, publications, it's a lot about applied uh, um, sort of research, uh, capacity building. Um, you're fortunate in Canada, I always use Canada as an example of one of the countries that has been leading this the kind of development of capacity in the health law space. Uh, but when we look outside maybe a handful of countries, there's not a lot of uh, places in which we have lawyers that are strengthening capacity to health law work. So we want to we spend a lot of time trying to strengthen those capacities. We have partnerships with universities from all over the world, but also with international organizations and regional organizations about strengthening capacity of future actors like law schools, but also strengthening capacity of current health actors, uh, training ministries of health, also legal actors that engage in the health space. And our research projects, that's where we spend most of our time and most of our work. Um, I wanted to say, in, if you have any questions while I'm presenting, if something is not clear, if uh, my Spanish accent is distracting you, you're not getting what I'm saying, feel free to interrupt and I can, I can clarify. Um, so why NCDs and human rights? Let's start with non-communicable diseases. We know at the center, these are the diseases chronic diseases, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, cancers. Um, the work that we try to do from a legal regulatory perspective on non-communicable diseases is not focusing on the access piece, on the treatment side, but trying to tackle the risk factors for non-communicable diseases. And we know those are the four key risk factors. Uh, harmful use of alcohol, tobacco use, physical inactivity, and unhealthy diets. So we build projects and we build like our research and our analysis around how do we use law as a tool to try to tackle those risk factors. What are some of the interventions that are backed by evidence that we can use to minimize the impact that those risk factors have in society as a whole? But the question is here, why human rights? Uh, we started from this uh, uh, both from an academic but also from a practical perspective. Uh, the, the industry, in this case the tobacco industry, but the same argument could be made for the food industry or the alcohol industry, to a certain extent co-opted the human rights argument. When you speak to traditional human rights actors, uh, for example, we, we have a hearing um, next month in front of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, and when you speak with those traditional human rights actors, they still don't see why non-communicable diseases is a human rights issue. Why should we frame it around a state obligation to protect Popu uh, health uh, of the population. Um, and I think part of that has to do that there's a lot of influence of the industry and how they frame that debate. It's all about that idea of a paternalistic state coming in and taking away our freedoms. Why is the government telling me what to eat, wh where to smoke, how much to drink? Is that idea that there's an inherent conflict between civil and political rights and this public health goals that we're trying to achieve? Um, and I said that because I live in that, I think in both worlds. Uh, I spend a lot of time in the health law world. Uh, that's where the institute is. But I come from a human rights sort of background world. So I, I do a lot of work with UN bodies, with uh, uh, regional human rights mechanisms, and with key actors at the country level that, uh, that work on human rights. Um, and I mentioned that hearing in front of the Inter-American Commission, and it took us over a couple of years to convince the commission that uh, industry behavior in the context of tobacco arise for a human rights issue. That it, 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 it was at that level that the state needed to intervene to prevent industry from continuing to uh, harm health. Um, when I say that to people in the public health community, I say it's obvious, we all know that, right? There's no question about it. But we tend to live in that public health bubble. If we go outside that, we still haven't been able to mainstream this uh, in the broader uh, human rights community or the broader legal community for that matter. Um, so this is another argument not only to shift 
the, the, the debate, the legal debate from what the industry has been arguing to uh, what we think uh, it's a more uh, comprehensive and more um, integral way to see human rights obligations, but also to really uh, strengthen a point. In a lot of countries, using a human rights argument really strengthen a state position, a government position to try to push for policy reform. Uh, these are some of the practical reasons, impetus for policy reform that I just mentioned. How we can use as NCDs international agreements, being binding agreements or non-binding agreements, to inform the content of state obligations. How do we inform the right to health with the, rec the WHO recommendations of marketing of foods and non-alcoholic beverages to children? They really need to come up with a shorter name for those recommendations. <laughs> Um, how do we use the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control to really define the content of state obligations when it comes to health? And that I think it's a very uh, um, compelling story when we can tell it like that. Um, also the recommendations, uh, the use of human rights tools, human rights mechanisms to monitor compliance with health obligations. Uh, this is a work we started to do at the uh, uh, UN in 2008 to try to get UN actors to assess states' obligations, but using health treaties as a, as a proxy to then assess uh, uh, right to health obligations. So there's a UN resolution on NCDs that was adopted in 2010. The only other time the UN General Assembly has adopted a health-related resolution was with HIV. So we do think there's already a momentum kind of growing at the international community to try to really consider NCDs it's a priority, but also consider NCD as a human rights issue, and um, we now need to do the legal work and the more like technical work to try to make that happen. Very basically, freedom of expression. Um, I'm not going to spend much time talking. These are very basic ideas. Uh, freedom of expression is a fundamental right. We all know that. Uh, the human rights movement really took on civil and political rights uh, at their heart, and freedom of expression is one of the most fundamental rights. Um, so it's universally acknowledged both as a fundamental right uh, and a foundational human right. It's a cornerstone of democracy. The right to freedom of expression is protected by a multi multitude of regional and international treaties. So we know that. Uh, the question here, here is whether commercial speech fits under the right to freedom of expression. And that's where I'm going to probably base most of my uh, presentation. Is this, um, is this cover on the, the right to freedom of expression? Should it be covered? How do we make sure that we build a cohesive legal framework to assess that and to answer that question. There are two basic arguments uh, or two basic sort of lines of thought that you can follow here and then we'll, we'll connect this with case law. One is that it's not protected. That commercial speech is not a protected category under the right to freedom of expression. Why? Because what we try to do with commercial speech is just to sell a product. We're not engaged in kind of exchange of ideas which is what uh, uh, People think it's at the core, and scholars in this space think it's at the core of uh, freedom of expression. Um, the other argument is it is protected under the right to freedom of expression, but the right to freedom of expression can be limited. It accepts limitations. At the UN level, when you see how the right is enshrined, it does accept limitation, but also at the constitutional level. And I'm a little bit rusty on Canadian constitutional law because I looked at it last time in 2005. But I think there's a test called, uh, is it Oak's test to restrict uh, uh, rights in the Canadian Charter? It's that same principle. If we have a right that is enshrined in international human rights law, how do we develop a test to determine if restrictions of those rights are justifiable? Which in this case would be applying that Oak's test to that. Um, so those are the recommendations that I'm going to use as another example, though these are not on, on alcohol, these are non-alcoholic uh, beverages. There's a lot of evidence that informs that companies are trying to market their product and in this case it has, it influences children's food preferences, uh, purchases and in general uh, the consumer. And here I just want to make a pause and talk about evidence. How do we integrate evidence into this space? When we think of law and health law, if we think it exclusively from the legal perspective, we're not necessarily developing methodologies to use evidence to inform our work. And that has been one of the challenges. Um, when courts want to be very restrictive, they put most countries in, uh, in a catch-22 situation because they require you to provide evidence of the effectiveness of the measure that you want to implement before you can implement the measure, right? 
So in New York, if, if Bloomberg wanted to ban large uh, portions of sodas, uh, one of the arguments was he needs to prove that banning the large size will have an impact on reduction on consumption of sodas across the board. Uh, or or the, the Slurpee or whatever were, were, were the, uh, the drinks that were going to be bad. Um, one of the challenges is the only way to generate that evidence is by having the measure in place and assessing the impact of the measure. So you're not letting me try, but you're requiring me this very high evidentiary proof when you need to assess whether the measures are uh, proportional, effective, uh, et cetera. Um, that's one of the challenges that we're seeing in the space of non-communicable diseases. There's this push to try to use the language of evidence base, but to an extreme that is limiting what countries can do in terms of regulatory approaches. We, of course, will have the trailblazers, the Uruguays of the world, or New York, or some provinces or states that will try. And they'll try it, and then they'll come up with some data. And maybe your jurisdiction will allow you to present comparative data from another country because that's happened also in the US. They say, no, no, our epidemiological uh, distribution of disease and, and populations is different, so that data doesn't reflect how this will have an impact here. You need to generate specific data of the situation here. And Larry Gostin, who's a scholar in, in health law, global health law, uh, always uses the example of, and he's a faculty director of the O'Neill Institute, he uses the example of why do we require that high level of evidence for health policies but not for other policies across the board. We never require that evidence when countries are trying with economic policy. Um, we don't require to prove that uh, increasing taxes, reducing taxes is gonna have a, a, an impact on unemployment or not. We just let them try because we think it's within the government prerogative to try to make the most out of the policy. In health law, we continue to do that and we need to be careful because as lawyers and when, when I, we are engaged in litigation in the context of tobacco, it's very easy to, to have that evidence. There's a lot of uh, uh, studies that can prove the effectiveness of the measure, that can prove that the only effective measure is a full ban on marketing, and we'll talk about that in a sec. But in other spaces, we need to have more flexibility. We need to build a legal test so governments have that flexibility to regulate, and they're not tied necessarily by that evidence. Uh, So this is more content from uh, WHO recommendations. Um, there's evidence of the effectiveness of marketing regulation. Uh, the overall objective of the policy should be to reduce exposure uh, and to protect children. These are recommendations that are very, like, uh, I don't know what happened there. It's, uh, there's some issue with the formatting of the PowerPoint. But um, you can look at, at this recommendation. They talked about like specific actions that states can take. They uh, put a lot of the burden on the state to develop those domestic uh, sort of ways of implementing or measure the effectiveness of the, of, the, of the intervention. And I'll stop now and ask any questions on what I've said before? Things that are not clear. No? Okay. So then I'll go to the, to the core of the presentation, which is rights in conflict. So the tobacco industry versus bans and advertisement. This has been a long, long history of uh, litigation against any government regulation that tries to restrict commercial speech. Um, they have, I mean, this is, uh, you probably know a lot about tobacco and how the industry has behaved and how they have uh, um, tried to assert their constitutional rights in a, without using proper evidence. So there's a, lo a lot of data on that. Um, but the main argument here that the industry, uh, sorry, yes, uh, that the industry is trying to make is that bans on advertisement, promotion, and sponsorship violates its right to freedom of commerce and right to freedom of expression. That's the main argument. When a country decides to restrict or marketing, bans on marketing, they're affecting our fundamental rights. Uh, therefore, they should be stricken down by court. Our argument from a human rights perspective is that the right to health permits and requires restrictions on commercial speech. If we have the evidence that marketing is leading to an increased consumption of the product and the companies are using that marketing to target children, target vulnerable populations, then it's a, there's a positive obligation on the state to intervene and regulate those spaces. That's how we're trying to develop that argument. The right to health imposes an obligation to regulate those spaces. Um, 
when, when I talked about this in the, in, in the US, it's, it's a little bit harder to picture a constitutional violation by omission, meaning that if you do nothing, you're violating the constitution because of the idea of a negative constitution. But in human rights law and in other countries, we do have positive obligations enshrined at the constitutional level. So doing nothing can be unconstitutional, and that's the, the main argument. Inaction in this space could be framed as a constitutional rights violation and human rights violation. So this is the main industry argument. Advertising and marketing are protected from free speech. Therefore, restrictions on product marketing violate freedom of expression. Freedom of expression prohibits any kind of censorship, which is, is true, and advertisement and marketing are protected forms of speech. What are some of the counter arguments? And this I mentioned uh, a little bit before. The first one is that commercial speech is not considered protected under the right to freedom of expression. Freedom of expression is the means to express concerns, opinions, or ideas. Commercial speech is the expression of ideas related to only the issuer's economic interest. So what is advertising doing? It's really trying to position a product in the market. It's not, as a general rule, giving any information on the product. It's not a way in which companies are engaging in political, social, sort of cultural debate. We need to be careful about how we frame this argument. And towards the end, or in the question and answer, we'll, I'll have a comment about that. Um, the second line of argument is commercial speech is protected under the right to freedom of expression, but this right requires, uh, allows for limitations. The challenge there connects with what I said before. To justify the limitation of the right to freedom of expression, which is an essential fundamental right, in which any test is going to be applied with a higher sort of level of scrutiny, you really have to have a lot of evidence that sometimes is very hard to gather. So that's one of the, it's a practical challenge. I think it's uh, um, also uh, can make the academic argument to, to, to on, on this first point, but there's a very, that's practical dimension. If you were to concede this, how are you gonna generate the evidence that justify limiting this fundamental right? So another industry argument, because of the importance of freedom of speech, the state must not be allowed to pass a priori judgment on the value of any speech. This is previous censorship. Before you speak, you're limiting what you say. The, the counter-argument is that because the right is less protected, uh, a priori restrictions can be justified. This is one that is important. Consumers have the right to information. And the basic counter-argument is that in marketing, there's not a lot of information that is being provided to the consumer, right? And it's interesting because in a lot of countries that you don't have a, a right to obligation enshrined in legal or even at the UN level or inter-American system level, the right to access of information is the flip side of the right to freedom of expression, right? On one side you have freedom of expression, on the other side you have the positive dimension of that right, which is the right to access to information. Um, the counter argument is that yes, consumers have the right to accurate information, so the price and content of the product, uh, but that doesn't necessarily come through uh, advertising. Another argument, Ad advertising restrictions violate freedom of commerce. Which when when the, the argument cannot be built around freedom of expression, they say, oh, but freedom of commerce can be affected by it. The main counter argument that this is an easier one, and courts have been very kind of uh, navigated this in, a, in, a, in, a, in an easier way, is just to say that your main uh, economic uh, driver is to sell your product, to put your product in the market, to produce manufacturing, to sell your product. It's not at the core of your commercial freedom to advertise for your product. So that is not even uh, considered uh, part of your uh, core uh, economic uh, freedoms. Um, so this is how proportionality tests will work and this is how it works in Panama. The Supreme Court of Panama decided that commercial speech was a protected category under the right to freedom of expression, and they decided to do this proportionality test. Um, they said that a restriction was justified with the evidence they had. I'm very concerned about that argument, whether that argument can be that case, a case like that could be win outside of, uh, of Panama. Um, and the main thing is that when it comes to this part of the test, and I don't want to bore you with a lot of uh, sort of legal human rights sort of uh, technicalities. Uh, but when it comes to necessity, that specific step of the test requires you to prove that there's not an alternative uh, intervention that we're gonna help you achieve the same goal, but it will be least re less restrictive on 
the rights that you're trying to uh, limit. So how do I generate evidence that demonstrates that a full ban is the only way to uh, have the impact that I'm trying to seek and not a ban that allows for marketing between 1 a.m. and 2 a.m.? How about uh, a, ba a full ban but an exception to direct communication with consumers? How do I generate that data that those specific measures are not going to help me achieve the same outcome? When you have a more flexible test, you allow more flexibility for the policy decision making. But when it's a very narrow test, it's, it's harder to, uh, to come up with that data. In this case, the court uh, um, really uh, require and kind of use the evidence they had there to build their answer to the case. I think this is one of the main cases uh, from Colombia, from the Constitutional Court of Colombia. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Constitutional Court of Colombia, but in the health space, They've been at the forefront of really defining state obligations when it comes to health. They're, one of, they're regarded as one of the most, um, I was going to use the word progressive, but that's probably not what I wanted to see out of the court. Uh, but they have elaborated on, on specific uh, content of the right to health. Um, so they challenge uh, a law that banned advertisement uh, of tobacco products, or restricted advertisement of tobacco products. Um, and this is something I wanted to mention because in every region, every country, whenever there's any um, intervention that tries to regulate tobacco, we'll see, the same, we'll see the same thing with alcohol, with food, that tries to establish some sort of regulation on the product, those measures are challenged in court. That's going to happen. I mean, the industry, the tobacco industry had what they call the uh, unlimited uh, checkbook for tobacco control litigation. So they were going to challenge everything. Uh, right now, we all might agree that smoke-free places are, they're a valid measure, right? There's evidence, uh, there's, um, uh, the main argument there is that it's fine if you have your, your freedoms, but your actions shouldn't affect the rights and the health of other people, so you shouldn't smoke in an enclosed public place. So I, th I thought and th that we were past that. Uh, <laughs> but in 2011, when Peru enacted a smoke-free law, the tobacco industry challenged it in court. Even after they have lost other cases, even after we know that this is not that complicated to justify legally, they still are going to try to challenge that. Um, this brings to a larger issue that I mentioned now, but we can uh, discuss in more detail uh, the Q&A, which is this co corporate behavior in the health space. How do we really can anticipate, and how can we think as health lawyers, how do we build solid arguments to try to prevent this kind of corporations for uh, affecting policy, uh, governments that poli the policies the government wants to push forward. Um, and I said, I mean, I was watching TV uh, last night. Uh, I try not to watch the Republican <laughs> debate, but <laughs> such an attractive thing. I was there on TV, and I said, just to, like a little bit. And this was was uh, was more for their standards. It was more civilized. It was not a lot of like name calling, but still, I watch a little bit of that. But then I was going through the channels and I saw this ad from Coca-Cola. It's a Canadian ad that looked exactly like tobacco, con tobacco companies uh, advertisement from like 20, 25 years ago. The same thing. Associating freedom with uh, drinking uh, uh, Coca-Cola, like people like playing sports and drinking Coca-Cola. I mean, not a lot of people that are into competitive sports will drink Coca-Cola <laughs> after their, uh, their other, other things they'll go for. Um, but it was very similar. Like people like in a motorcycle with a Coca-Cola, it's, it's very uncomfortable to have a drink when you're riding a motorcycle. But it's that idea of freedom, connecting the product with uh, trying to create that perception in society that, OK, this relates to my autonomy, my self-determination. I'm free and I drink Coca-Cola, which is the same argument that we all bought from the tobacco industry. Uh, I started smoking when I was 15, and I smoked for, I don't know, 10 years. Um, and I started smoking because that was kind of already built into my understanding of life and society. I mean, growing up, my father was a smoker. I was still enjoying this uh, morning over breakfast. I went to school, elementary school, and I had a Marlboro backpack which right now will be very I mean, front upon. Why did, but it was totally normal. I have like my backpack, my like, uh, like notebook. I had a jacket. Everything was just branded. So I already had developed that loyalty with a brand that I didn't even was a kind of consumer of, and I couldn't be. I started smoking when I was 15. So that's 10 years before 
the receptors in my brain fully developed. So I was over I mean, I got overstimulated for nicotine. So it kind of, it, and that's what the industry is trying to do. The industry is trying to position their product so they can get more, the tobacco industry, uh, more uh, consumers. And now we're seeing the same thing with the food industry, the same thing with the alcohol industry, right? Now it's like drinking and freedom, sponsoring concerts. We get rid of, uh, or the, the governments have been trying to restrict marketing of tobacco on sports. Uh, and then what, when we didn't have like the Marlboro soccer tournament, it got replaced by whatever, the Budweiser soccer tournament. And now that maybe there's already something, you know, how do we restrict this and try not to associate alcohol with sports, now it's a Coca-Cola soccer tournament. And it's fine. If you look at the Olympics, the main sponsors of the Olympics are Cadbury, Coca-Cola, McDonald's. So they're really trying to position and create that uh, connection in society. Um, I think when, if I were to put this on a scale of uh, easy and hard to regulate, um, and I know this has been recorded, and I don't want to say that it was easy to regulate tobacco. There's a lot of work that went behind that, and it was many years of work to get to the point in which we're right now. But it's one product, one single product. Well, we want to see that we, people argue that there are differences. It's the same, the same cigarette. I mean, there's not a lot of difference. Uh, the different brands, and there's seven big corporations. And those are the ones driving this. Seven corporations, one product. When we go to alcohol, we have three industries. Beer, wine, spirits. Within those industries, we have local producers, regional producers, international. We have the Pernod Ricards and the, uh, the Ageos, but we also have the local, I'm sure there's like Nova Scotia beer producers or... Uh, there might be. There might be, I don't know. Uh, so that's a different regulatory scheme when you look at how do we regulate those big corporations or how do we really engage with... So it becomes a little bit harder. On tobacco, we argue that no use of tobacco or every use of tobacco is harmful to health. So one cigarette is harmful to health. With alcohol, we frame it as excessive use of alcohol is harmful to health. So then we already have created some more complication for a regulatory pathway in the case of alcohol. When it comes to food, that's kind of very complicated. Food is essential for human life. And we really need to look at industries, different industries, um, everything from fast food to junk food to whole food. So it's a much more complex regulatory scheme because it has to do with where do you buy the product? How do we, you control price differences, right? Um, I was telling Joanna as well, one of our projects we're trying to, to elaborate right now is try to assess where countries should focus on when it comes to food uh, uh, regulation. Um, there are countries like the U.S. in which the price point has already shifted. So it's much more expensive to eat healthy than to eat <coughs> junk food. Maybe Canada is at that point. I'm not sure if it is. So when you're there, it's harder to really try to get to people that, that in the lower socioeconomic status, they're going to go for the cheaper option. I mean, if you give them information, you try to use these traditional ways to regulatory ways or ways to engage with consumers, I don't think we're going to make a, that much traction unless we focus on price. But in other countries in which that price shift hasn't happened, maybe the focus should be agricultural subsidies. Let's try to keep those prices there so junk food, fast food continues to be uh, not the default choice but the expensive choice. Uh, in the context of marketing, it's, it's similar. Where do we focus on marketing? Marketing restrictions tend to have an impact across the population, but of course they have more impact on middle class and higher socioeconomic status that get more influenced by this type of access to informa informational campaigns on government and restrictions on, on marketing. Um, so this is not, this, none of this was in, in the presentation, so I make a, a slight <laughs> sort of detour. And I was checking the time, say like I'm doing very good at time, and now I might not be doing good at time. Um, <laughs> So advertisement of tobacco products, this is what the court in Colombia said, advertisement of tobacco products is to encourage consumption of tobacco. Consumption of tobacco has been deemed considered high risk activity by the government. Therefore, activities involving risk should be regulated by the state. It's a very simple sort of uh, uh, legal analysis. Um, second step was uh, the goal of advertising is not to inform but to simply change consumer preferences. 
Therefore, advertising is grounded in commercial freedom and not in freedom of expression. They argue that it's a commercial exercise of a right to commercial freedom. Um, and therefore, they argue the conclusion is commercial freedoms allow, uh, uh, the authorizer allow greater restriction. So you can restrict co commercial freedoms. This is an interesting idea um, that, uh, that they're borrowing from, uh, from the literature uh, about a passive market, uh, which is an activity that is tolerated, is decriminalized, is tolerated in society, but the government will impose specific regulatory measures to minimize their impact in society, to uh, not promote, to kind of restrict how that activity is carried out in society. Um, I know people are taking notes from the, from the case language. I'm more than happy, we have an, an English translation of the case. I think the translation of a summary is 100 pages long, but uh, we're happy to, yeah. The Constitutional Court of Colombia is known for having very long decisions. There's a decision on, on, on the restructuring of the healthcare system. I think it's around 1,000 pages, the, the, the decision, um, and I have to confess here, and even on video, that I have only read like the 300 page summary of the, <laughs> of the case. I've never read the entire sort of uh, uh, decision. Uh, but I, I can share that with you. Maybe, uh, John, I can give it to you. If the students are interested, we can, we can look at this case. Uh, before I finish, so I have two more minutes now. Um, that's uh, what we're talking about here is uh, in, the, in the case of marketing, marketing restrictions is um, how do we build a system a legal system around specific products or behaviors in society that allow us to minimize the negative impacts that they may have and maximize the potential benefit. So how do we bring things from criminal law to a regulatory scheme? And how do we bring issues from a complete free market to a space in which the government can regulate? Um, and I'll finish with an example that has nothing to do with the title of my presentation of what you were told I was gonna be talking about, which is marijuana. Right now, we're at that point in which we're thinking, how do we bring marijuana from a space in which there's a lot of evidence that criminal law in the context of cannabis is not achieving what we expected criminal law to achieve? We have a lot of evidence. How do we bring that through a legalization, legalization process, but build a very strong regulatory uh, system so we regulate how the product is, uh, marketing of the product, we regulate the price, who can sell, who can buy, who can consume, and the state can take more ownership over that regulation. So it doesn't minimize, it doesn't undermine public health gains. That's part of, that's where a lot of the work that we do in this space at the Institute is trying to find that spot. Where, how, what type of regulations we need to in, in, put in place so we continue to protect public health, but we do it in a way that it's getting us where we, we need to go. Um, some people say free market, it fixed by itself, it, it never happens. I mean, a free market model, if we let uh, I don't know, the, the marijuana industry, if we, let, if we allow for a big cannabis industry to develop, that's gonna undermine everything we're trying to do with legalization. Because when you have a big industry behind something, what they wanna do is continue to sell their product. They wanna increase the consumption of the product in society. That's how they make money. So you need to regulate it now that we have the opportunity in this spe specific case in a way that doesn't set us up for failure down the line. Um, and I think in marketing, we have a, a lot of evidence of the impact that marketing has had uh, on tobacco, use alcohol. We're getting to food now and how do we regulate effectively in, in, in those spaces, that's part of the question. And how do we do it in a way that we have the evidence so we don't need to think that we're creating a conflict between human rights obligations and those specific uh, policy interventions. So I'll stop now. Thank you, and I'm here if you have any questions for me. Thank you. So thank you so much, uh, Oscar, for the presentation. And if I can just take a page out of uh, Prime Minister Trudeau's book, mm -hmm. which is that Georgetown might be doing this work, but Oscar is one of us. <laughs> Oscar did his LLM at the University of Toronto um, with a specialization in uh, health law and was a member of our uh, Canadian health law community uh, for a very long time. So Thank you. Uh, we're very proud of you. Um, so please, the floor is open.
Um, first of all, welcome, and I really enjoyed your presentation. And I'm really glad you mentioned you, you spent some time on the deep pockets theme because, of course, the uh, the deep pockets of industries like tobacco really do have an impact on vindicating and declaring the rights that you're talking about. Um, and I'm thinking of an Australian case where even before it ever got to courts, the regulators settled around a dispute marketing of like so-called light cigarettes. And when challenged, they said, if we had taken the industry on, we would have blown our whole annual budget in one dispute. And so that deep pockets problem, if I can put it that way, exists along the whole continuum. And so I'd be interested in hearing your view on what you think about um, the litigation or dispute resolution processes that you might have seen uh, that are effective. Um, and in particular, maybe the class action. I happen to have a view about the capacity of the class action to deal with cases like this, where you've got a litigator like the tobacco industry that takes a scorched earth, take no prisoners approach to uh, solve the dispute. So I'd be interested in hearing your views on that. Um, that, that, that is a very good question. Thank you very much for, for that. Um, I think the big pocket, it's, it's a big, it's, it's an issue, and that's what I've, I've started, at some point I mentioned, they're already repeating a playbook, so they have the strategy built on. They know exactly what they're doing, why they're challenging, and I always use this Uruguay as an example. Uruguay is a tiny country, 3.5 million people living in, in Uruguay, but it has been at the forefront of pushing for tobacco control regulation. And now they're embarking on, on alcohol regulation. They're the only country in the world that has uh, legalized marijuana as a country, as a national sort of, uh, as a nation. So they're be pushing for a lot of these things. Um, so what happened in uh, 2000 and, uh, am I get the year, year wrong? Eight or, no, nine or 10. Uh, they increased pictorial health warnings on the, on the tobacco package, so they went from 55 to 85, so it's larger, it's a larger sort of image. The, the, the argument is that it will have a better, like a more strong impact on the, uh, the measure will be more impactful. And they decided to allow only one brand per product because they said, look, we want to avoid, we, we would try to, we banned misleading advertisements. So light, low tar, all of that was banned. But what the industry did is that they created colors, a color scheme. So it was like Marlboro yellow, Marlboro green, Marlboro white. And then they had, uh, uh, in every store, there was kind of a, like a one page. We just said, okay, Marlboro yellow is what used to be Marlboro light. So they, they were trying to undermine government, sort of the prohibition of misleading advertisement. So the government said, that's enough. We're gonna have only one uh, presentation per brand. So Marlboro, go and choose which one you want. Of course, you're gonna go with Marlboro red, but each brand could only have one presentation. So the industry challenged that domestically, of course, and we were working with the Ministry of Health at that point with the, with the lawyers that were uh, responding to this, and they won the case. It was just, oh, we won. It's just a, the, we weren't even concerned. Why was this case not, it was not, there, there were not that many good arguments from the industry. It was really, uh, but they won, of course, cel celebratory. Sometime after that, that's when Philip Morris filed uh, an investment uh, case against Uruguay in front of the ICSID, which is an international uh, investment dispute resolution mechanism. And of course, at that point, when, when I first heard that, what came to mind is what all they were doing was exhausting domestic remedies so they could challenge this government policy at the international level. If you look at the size of the Uruguay market, it's 3.5 million people, prevalence, it's around 30, 25% smokers. Out of those smokers, only 10 to 15% smoke Marlboro. The rest smoke their local, there's another local brand, which is the more popular one. So it's a market that is this, I mean, it's so tiny, 3.5 million, 30%, and then 10% of that. It's just, it's small, it does not significant. So what the industry was trying to do was send a message to the world, and definitely to Latin America and to the world, that whoever, to try to in, in, um, implement this type of measures needed to be careful because they were going to be sued. Um, I mean, regulatory chill, if you mm -hmm. want to call it that. Um, the Uruguayan government, of course, it was the same reaction. How do we litigate this case against this big corporation? We're a small country. I mean, do we have the capacity to engage in this? They were ready to uh, enter into an agreement and withdraw the regular. I mean, that, that's wh where this went. 
and then a group of people, including other two people. I was there and another colleague from the Institute and, and other organizations went there. We met with the government. I mean, we provide the evidence. We said, Look, you have a strong case. But the main challenge was the, the fees. I mean, who's going to pay for the lawyers? Who's going to pay if we lose? Uh, so at the end, international foundations decided to support the government of Uruguay in responding to this lawsuit. And the case is pending. Should be decided within the next six months. So by default, we will know whether when Uruguay decided to eliminate or to restrict how many presentations each brand could have, whether that had an impact on the investment that Philly Morris was trying to do, trying to make in, in your ways. So that was the main argument. We had this IP rights over all of these brands. We have made all this investment in this country. Now you're not letting us uh, use them. You're affecting our investment. So I think that's one of the, of the challenges is that on our side, on, on, on the side of public health law, we're always trying to reinvent the wheel. There's a new suit. OK, let's just see how do we do this new. And they're not. They're just following the same playbook. They, they have the same law firms all over the world. So they have the strategy designed already. Um, so we need to be more creative on how we think of litigation in this space. And there's a couple of very interesting initiatives going on right now of using strategic litigation, but more on the offensive to try to affect uh, interests, uh, uh, corporate interests. Uh, so there are a couple of cases in Argentina. Uh, there's some cases, uh, big uh, cases around healthcare recovery costs that were successful in the U.S. that led to the master settlement agreement. But there are other countries that are exploring some of that. So I think it's, that's part of, of our thinking. We, we had a project with a campaign for tobacco free kids in 2008, and that's what we were thinking. How do we use legal avenues within litigation to more effectively kind of uh, try to limit the impact that the corporations will have in this space? Um, I mean, that's a longer term game. Uh, we, have th we have thought of class actions. We have thought more of a constitutional type of litigation. There are some countries in which uh, corporations are subjects of constitutional law in the sense that they have obligations, so they could be challenged on their constitutional grounds. Uh, and they're more big public interest litigation, so you don't need to determine standing in some of the more technical things. So there's a lot of thinking be behind that. Uh, but that's, that's a big issue. We'll see it with food. We'll see it with other corporations. It's going to be the same. Uh, Rights um, argument. How do you assess an outright ban from regulations? Uh, and what, how would you comment on the approach to tobacco versus marijuana, particularly looking at the fact that some countries are increasingly legalizing marijuana? Sure, but, but we're not, I would never argue for a ban on tobacco. I think what we need to do is continue to strengthen regulation so we minimize the consumption of tobacco to a point in which it's a marginal society hump like 5%, 3%, but never move to a full ban. We can ban advertisement of the product, which based on a project we're doing right now uh, on marijuana, building, kind of trying to design regulatory uh, mechanisms for marijuana, it could be a recommendation as well. Never allow for marijuana to be marketed. So that piece we can do. We can restrict, I mean, the mar there's evidence on marketing restrictions, but we would never go to the point, at least from our perspective, the Institute, my individual perspective here, because it's being recorded, I'm talking on my own personal capacity, not as <laughs> director of the institute. I don't think prohibition in the context of tobacco is going to be more effective than continue to strengthen those regulatory interventions. So I think when we do that, we're in line with human rights law because what we're doing, we're allowing a product in the market. It's harmful, yes. We're just providing information to the consumers. We are making it hard for, for the, those products to be placed on vulnerable consumers, children, and... Uh, we are making it not accessible, uh, making it less accessible. So people that really want to use the product are just kind of taking a conscious decision of using the product. Um, and I think we can build some similar sort of regulatory uh, uh, kind of schemes for, for marijuana. Does, does that answer your question? To some extent, but if you're saying it is a human, there is a human right to health, then why not ban it altogether? Unless you're saying ideally we would, but it's not. So is it an expediency that you're regulating versus making? I think the unintended consequence of banning is creates more problems for public health because it has been shown. There's a lot of evidence that criminal law in the space of health doesn't, have the, the, doesn't achieve the, the goals that we're trying to achieve. It has, we have evidence in abortion. We have evidence on, uh, and abortion is a much more complex issue because 
there's not even a justification for banning. Uh, but we have, uh, or from a human rights perspective, uh, we have that evidence on uh, prohibition of alcohol in the U.S. So it doesn't really, it creates a black market that is completely unregulated and the state kind of, all the, the state can do is use its police power to criminalize. There's a lot of data that shows that in the U.S. Uh, prosecutions for marijuana related offenses have increased and that hasn't had an impact on reduction of the price, on, on, on increase of the price. The price keeps dropping. So it hasn't created what, uh, so I think it's a practical, but also that's how we inform what is fulfillment of human rights. We really try to incorporate evidence into this assessment because under the right to health, states need to do or in regulate, ensure that people can, can live healthier lives and regulate conditions in society so people can be healthy, but that needs to be informed by, by, by evidence. So in this case, I think a full ban won't be as effective for fulfilling the right to health as a very regulated uh, system. So I have another marijuana question, um, which might open a bit of a can of worms, but as you talked about how important the role of evidence is in uh, deciding how you regulate products. And I was just wondering, what do you see the role of evidence in the regulation of marijuana and how that be different from tobacco? Because it, like, I just had a quick check on like Health Canada's website, and even they seem to have a really difficult time kind of articulating the adverse effects of marijuana when compared to like tobacco or alcohol, except like in the case of youth flick. And um, even though that's like, a pretty controversial topic in itself, do you think that um, evidence in this case would actually be could be used by the people trying to market marijuana and, and saying like, oh, this is actually much safer than tobacco, so you should regulate this less. I mean, the, I think the argument can be made. The counter argument there is that you don't want to increase the consumption of this product that may have, and already there's evidence that shows that depending on how you consume the product, you, it has negative consequences on health. I mean, combustible marijuana, there's some studies that show that has similar impact on cardiovascular disease than cigarette because it's a combustion effect, the one that has, I don't, I mean, maybe there are physicians here, I have no, I cannot worry the concrete argument, but there's a study from U UCSF that was published recently that made that specific uh, connection. So I think the allowing the product in the market, and of course there's impaired uh, driving while uh, intoxicated with or while uh, having um, been used marijuana may have also. I think there's definitely a way to build that system, that regulatory system. Um, and what we think is just continue to reassess. This is not this is not something we do now and it ends. This is continue we continue to reassess. I know that in five, 10, 20 years we'll have more evidence of the impact that cigarette consumption has had on other things that we didn't know. And then we need to see uh, is does this require a not a change in our regulatory approach? Should we be do, doing something different? Um, so I think that's the space in which we are. We, we're, as, as the products are being used more in, like, in countries, in, in kind of states, uh, uh, we might be able to generate more evidence of a, at a population level, uh, what's the impact of it. Right now we know what the impact of the product is on health, well, because there's some studies that have tried to make that connection. Uh, but at a population level, there might be other effects that we might not know that they will exist. Uh, so how do we build that framework so we can correct? And as we generate more evidence, I mean, I don't, have, I don't have it in this presentation, but I mean, in the 40s, uh, physicians were advertising for uh, cigarettes. I mean, Camel had this thing with a bunch of physicians say, I smoke Camels, I mean, making that. And evidence started evolving, and then, of course, it became frowned upon for a physician to uh, be advertising for cigarettes. And then we continue to generate evidence. So it's not unique in the sense of how other, our understanding of other products. which allow the provincial government to claim uh, healthcare related costs for tobacco related wrongs against tobacco companies. And I'm wondering as to what you think the, the effectiveness of those kinds of lawsuits, like none of them have been concluded yet in Canada. Yeah. The Ontario and BC ones are currently underway, but they haven't actually gone to court yet. Um, so I'm wondering what you think the effectiveness of those will be in like kind of trying to regulate and making it undesirable to sell cigarettes in Canada, especially given the cost of those types of litigation suits 
for the core provincial governments because they are so expensive. Yeah. I think that there are two points here, and I didn't mention that when I talked about marketing, but the whole idea of restricting marketing and complementing that with informational campaigns on the part of the government is to change that social norm. To really think, I mean, this is not normal, right? I remember being in planes in the 80s and people were smoking in planes. I mean, now that's unthinkable. So we have made a lot of progress in changing that social norm. That's what we try to do with marketing and information. In this particular case, this is healthcare recovery costs. This is just the government trying to get back the cost that they spent on healthcare. This by itself, I don't necessarily think will have an impact. I mean, it, it could be used to kind of denormalize the product, could be used in, in, in other ways. But um, the other successful example of this is in the US, uh, that big case that ended up with the Master Settlement Agreement. It was the same thing, states suing for healthcare recovery costs, then it became this major sort of a lawsuit. Um, but the use, I mean, what, what that case has been very useful for is because as part of the agreement, there's of course funding that goes to do research to, uh, uh, on tobacco. There's a lot of different components of the agreement, but one of them is that we had access to industry documents, internal industry documents. So a lot of the evidence that we have right now on how they're targeting children, I mean, they're not, they, they, it was a very, this, like, a strategy that was built from the industry. So that was one of the positive aspects of that litigation. Um, we have evidence of like in, internal industry documents that read something like, uh, or oh, instead of being, I mean, we, we need to be a little bit concerned because Western countries, the US, Canada, are in, in, in implementing tobacco control measures. But this is a great opportunity for us to explore other on tap markets in Latin America, Asia, and, and Africa. Uh, so this is part of a, so that was useful from the, the that was a kind of useful result of the, of the agreement. Um, I think we need to continue to like, find different points of pressure to minimize the impacts they have in society. Healthcare recovery costs may have a longer term impact on really changing the economic dynamics of how the industry behaves. So I think it could be in that uh, uh, space, but not on the consumer in particular. There's one there. Yeah, um, thanks. Um, I follow mainly health and pharmaceuticals, and there was a, a case I wonder if you could comment on. It came out in the paper a couple of days ago about one of our companies arguing that they had a free speech right to promote free drug consumer advertising um, off label use of their drug. Did you familiar with that case? No, I'm not, but I'm familiar with the, with the broader topic of uh, direct to consumer advertising. Yeah. I was, I was surprised because the United States is already an outlier on consumer advertising of drugs. Um, and it seems like a real, um, a pretty uh, strange to be pushing for the right to um, promote drugs for off-label off use. Well, I think this is, it's, it's part of the same broader debate, and this is not my kind of area of focus or expertise, but this is part of the broader debate of corporations, speech, and marketing, to what extent it should be uh, uh, permitted. The U.S. is an outlier when it comes to freedom of expression and First Amendment and the expansion, expansive, expansive sort of uh, understanding of, of freedom of expression. Um, there are a lot of countries that, are, that have limited direct-to-consumer advertising. I thought that Canada was one of the countries that had regulation on direct-to-consumer advertising. But yesterday I was watching TV and I saw a bunch of advertisements for, for pharmaceutical products, so I need to go back and look at what are the, whether this was cable news, maybe. But then that's part of, a, and it was one, in one of the slides, how do you really regulate cross-border advertisement? Because if you are in a country, like in the middle of Europe, and everyone else you can advertise, you really need to come up with a system, but that's a, a separate, more uh, technical issue in advertisement. Um, I think it falls on, on, on the same principle. It can be regulated. If there's evidence that shows that off-label label use, it's going to have a detrimental impact because of information or asymmetry or all, all of the rationale behind restricting direct-to-consumer advertisement. I think it, it could apply in the same way. I don't think it's any different. Yeah. But I have to look at the facts of the case. Yes. Question. Yes. <laughs> so it's always uh, curious and kind of fun when you end up on the other side of the argument, right? So hmm, seems strange 
uh, insofar as having a clear line between commercial and political speech. Um, and that's because in my human rights work, I've argued the exact opposite. Uh, and in particular, we argued it around access to abortion services. Uh, because criminal markets and abortion services are actually a very effective form of advocacy when you want to try to move towards decriminalization in other jurisdictions. Um, so if anybody's interested, we did uh, a clinic project when I was at the University of Toronto fighting Google AdWords who had set restrictions on the advertising of abortion services on Google uh, and for whatever reasons it was criminal in some places, I mean they actually didn't provide uh, much of a rationale for it. And we argued in many ways in countries in which you have restrictions on abortion, being able to advertise safe and legal services in other places was both political speech as much as it was pushing a product. And so I wondered, you know, is the line better drawn at intention, you know, whether or not you're trying to sell your product, but of course we know that as healthcare goods are also market commodities, you know, sometimes the promotion of products is also the promotion of health care. Yeah. Um, so I wondered, yeah, I, I wonder how to develop a more principled understanding of this distinction between commercial and political speech. Yeah. Another piece is, you know, the women on waves. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the greatest political movements of access to medical abortion in Portugal was when someone held up the product on a TV, right, ad and promoted the product rather than abortion. The idea of it being commercial speech was what allowed it to be saved in some way, and it was an off-label use of an otherwise uh, medication for um, gastric ulcers, right? And so to promote a gastric ulcer medication, well, what's the problem with that? Of course, it also has this other use. So yeah, I wonder if you could comment on that. I think I um, agree with, with your um with your argument, we need to be much more careful in how we frame the issue around commercial speech. And I didn't want to get into all those technical details. One of the challenges is that commercial speech, it's mainly about placing the product in the market, but also can have an information kind of component built into it, right? Uh, and we are, I don't do it in the presentations, but we sometimes are critical of some of these decisions that make this blank statement that commercial speech is not protected on the rights of free expression. Co the argument should be commercial speech of this type of products because in this product there's not any information provided to the consumer. In this context, commercial speech is not a protected category in the right of expression. I think your argument is even more kind of a, has, adds another layer of complication because we're talking about health products and products. Uh, there's an obligation on the right to health about access to information in the health space built into the right to health. So in that case, I think we really are building a different sort of uh, uh, a legal structure to assess that. And I, I've mentioned to you the, the same argument goes with emergency contraception and to what extent you can force companies to really put uh, language into the, the packages of emergency contraception saying like they, this medication does not uh, uh, induce an abortion because it's, it's, it's information about the product itself. Uh, and in this case, it could be framed around uh, that uh, commercial speech sort of argument. So I see your point. I think the clear difference is that one of them, some of this are health products, this are not. Uh, but it's of the uniqueness of the product. So I wish some of these courts would have spent more time developing that distinction. It's not commercial speech as a whole, it's commercial speech because of the facts around this particular product and how this makes our analysis different. Some of them do that, but then they rush through kind of to get to the, to the, to the test and to the conclusion. But I see your point. And I think that the, in this other side, when it comes to uh, health uh, products, uh, it will be, we need to be built a much more cohesive principle sort of assessment. And I've, I've mentioned to Joanna this before, one of the advantages of us being in the health space across the board is that sometimes when you live in a specific health topic, health issue, you try to tweak all of the legal tools to be responsive to your health issue. So when we work with tobacco control people, we argue this is the most effective, cost-effective intervention in the world. The same thing, maternal mortality people will make the same argument. The same argument will be made about now about the food industry. If you do this, this is the most... And they are okay with tweaking, I mean, this advocacy organization, but sometimes even like a... a, a Scholars that just work on that one area, they can really try to adapt the legal reasoning to support their specific health issue. 
We work across the board on health issues. So when we are, all of our tobacco control colleagues were celebrating this decision, we thought it was a great decision, but that's one of the things I thought of. Oh, but the way they frame the standard, could it be problematic down the line when we want to do issues around access to information in the context of uh, contraception? Could that be, could we have set this up for a potential conflict with other health issues? We've talked about that in the health space across the board, the use of criminal law in the, in, in the health space, right? I said that in this context of changing social behavior, it hasn't been effective. Um, we have the same, even in abortion, we know that there shouldn't be a criminalization, but when it comes with sexual violence, we do favor specific criminal types. So there needs to be kind of, why is it different, applied across different health topics? So it's not that criminal law is always bad, what is the rational to justify that in this context makes sense and how do we build that assessment? And that's that my area of work, but I use it as another example. Okay. Um, kind of to, along the same vein, I'm curious about moving away from specific health uh, issues, so, but around alcohol marketing and women's role in hypersexuality uh, images and a lot of alcohol marketing. How is that type of speech uh, protected or not? And what are some of the counter arguments? Because we know that hypersexualization of women is a key marketing tool in a lot of big alcohol advertising and some of the impacts from that uh, and how some of the counter arguments we could propose around that. Sure. I think that goes in line. I, I would add this as another layer of arguments that should be used to support marketing restrictions of alcohol. So I think it's another layer. So like, look, not only has all this impacts, but the way the product has been placed has had a negative impact on perception of women in society and it has had all of this other. So I think it adds to the same line of reasoning. Um, but if we don't do it as a blanket sort of statement around the advertisement, then I'm concerned about regulating speech if we allow advertising, but then we want to restrict it. When you advertise, you shouldn't advertise in this particular way. I think it can be built, and I haven't thought in detail, if you want to leave advertisement of alcohol, not ban it. Let's say a country that wants to restrict it, but not come into a full ban. How do you, you regulate the content? I think there are ways, but it's, a, it's, it's more complicated. The way I would say it is that we understand marketing restrictions need to happen in the context of alcohol, and this is another layer of argumentation why they should happen, because they're creating all of these other issues on, on, on women. And does that answer your question? Often what happens is there's an argument around, well, if we're not going to have an overall uh, specific restrictions around alcohol advertising, because we do have restrictions around like underage images you know, in advertising and um, where some of these advertisements can be placed you know, in magazines that are geared towards a younger population or um, in certain locations that are really close to schools or you know, family centers, et cetera. So, We've kind of already gone down that route a little bit of you know specific framing of some policies, and so that was yeah. kind of my curiosity. No, I think that it's it, it's an interesting, it, and maybe there's uh, already some people that have looked at this from a legal perspective. I think there's blanket things around spaces, groups that you want to exclude from the exposure. What you're saying, it could maybe it can be framed, but my first thought was that that relates more of the to the content of the advertisement. How do we build that? And maybe there's ways in which you can build another layer of regulation of content. And it happens, I mean, with hate speech, I mean, there are ways in which you can get there, uh, but I haven't thought about, about the, the legal steps to, to do it, because I've been trying to focus on the broader restriction on the advertisement of a product. Great, so thank you for an uh, excellent set of questions, and please join me in thanking Oscar for an excellent well, thank presentation. You. Thank you.